I live a hundred years, I'll just never, ever be able to, uh, to, to tell the story uh, the way it really happened. These young kids who, uh, you just run up to them, and uh, when we were all boxed in, they were all around, and they were all over our perimeter, and we're throwing grenades, and I uh, got pretty close, and uh, just run up to one of these kids and say, uh, Marine, we're going to get out of here, aren't we? And uh, the kid look up to you and say, you're damn right we are, Skipper. I was 23 years old at, uh, when I went into Paris Island. I was somewhat older than the balance of the recruits at, in that barracks. Uh, I decided to go into the Marine Corps after I had left college, and uh, at that point I was 23 years old. I think the word jolt describes the initial uh, impression that you have, especially Paris Island, especially Marine Corps. The, uh, the screaming, the yelling, the constant uh, involvement in activities. But after a while, uh, and after a couple of weeks, I, I started to grasp it. I started to realize it was a schedule, and uh, a tight schedule. And I, I felt I became pretty acclimated pretty quickly. We were on a C-130, and the, the back of the C-130 opens up like a jaw. And I felt this inrush of heat. And I, I never, I never forgotten that. That's this, the heat of the, the off the tarmac there where the plane landed. Uh, we were uh, taken by bus t uh, to a, a transient area, then taken by truck uh, to southwest uh, uh, area of uh, southwest of Da Nang. And my feeling was, for I, I guess for maybe a month or so, uh, some anxiety, some. Uh, uh, sense of, am I going to do the right thing? What do I have to learn? I'm a new guy in a block. Uh, that kind of passed. You get somewhat acclimated uh, after a period of time. Uh, I was fortunate that, if you can say fortunate, I started my service time in Vietnam, southwest of Da Nang. It was an area that was occupied mostly with the Viet Cong, the VC, and we had Encounters with them, we had a lot of booby trap encounters, we had small firefights uh, and ambushes with them. And it was a learning curve for me. We gradually, the unit moved up to an area uh, known as uh, Camp Evans, and our activities increased greatly. And we w went out towards the Laotian border, and we, we on what which was called the Highlang National Forest, and we, we did patrols there and sweeps there, and we started to be engaged with the NVA, but not really in a great deal of uh, encounters. Then we f went up to Contien. My unit was the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, part of the 3rd Marine Division, also known as the Magnificent Bastards. We went up to Contien, and that's when we were heavily engaged with the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army. So my it was, as I say, a learning curve. I seemed to start off a little slow and then it gradually got faster and faster and more involved. And it was really involved when we went up to Contien. Well, initially, it was a sense of duty, a sense of my obligation to go in and join the Marine Corps, fight for what the, company, the country was, uh, stood for. And I think that's the broad picture. But as you get into combat, I think what happened, at least happened to me, is that narrowed down very much and became very specific. I was fighting for my own survival and the survival of the grunt, the Marine next to me. Combat is chaotic. Day to day up and around Contien was chaotic. Uh, we were situated outside the wire of Contien. Contien being a fire base just a couple of miles below the DMZ, the military zone. At that time, they situated four battalions, one in each quadrant around Contien. Being outside the wire, all we had were foxholes for protection. It was rainy, it was muddy, it was horrible. And every day we had incoming artillery, rockets, and mortar without fail. Conscien is just, an, it was originally a French outpost. It's just a hill. In fact, they call it hill, the Hill of Angels. And it's a fire base. And, and it really wasn't that large. I say like three-fourths city blocks wide. 
the North Vietnamese had tried to overrun it starting in 1966. And the Marine Corps took it over from the, uh, I think there was a small contingent of Arvin up, up there originally. The Marine Corps came in, enlarged the perimeter, fortified it even better, put barbed wire around, Constantino wire around it, minefields around it. And the purpose of our being there was to interdict the North Vietnamese Army from moving down south into what was Quang Tri Province. And we had many, many occasions where we came face to face with them. We knew they were there. Where they were exactly, you didn't know until you ran into them. Running patrols outside of where we were were extremely dangerous. There had been a history of encounters with large elements of uh, the, uh, the North Vietnamese Army, uh, battalion and regiment size elements. And uh, we followed the same trails as other units had followed and, and got involved in the similar type engagements. If they, if they were able to come through the DMZ and come past us, they had a free flow approach to Quang Tri Province, Quang Tri, and anything south of it. Uh, the Marine Corps had set up bases there starting around 66, and uh, it was known as Leatherneck Square, the way the bases were situated. And uh, Kantian being the most predominant at the time. My most difficult moments up in that area, and, and in fact, in, in my whole experience in Vietnam was on September 21st, uh, the second battalion uh, was designated to run a sweep east of Contien's perimeter. And the unit started out around 6.30 in the morning and we swept and we had, uh, Fox and Echo would come in from an eastern direction. They let golf company uh, move over to a southerly position and we was the sweeping area near the village of Phu Ak. Sweep means to essentially move, move online in this case move and sweep the enemy ahead of you into a blocking force that would precipitate the in involving encountering the enemy and, and eliminating the en enemy. So if you visualize Echo and Fox moving along in one direction and golf, and, and the idea was that Echo and Fox would swing south, sweep them south into golf company. But before we even were able to move in that direction on a, on a, on a swinging of the sweep, so to speak, uh, Fox Company got involved with sniper fire. They rushed the sniper fire only to be caught open in the open in open f fields with the, uh, the enemy that was well entrenched, well fortified, and uh, well numbered. And they had machine guns set up. It was an l shape type of ambush where they had fields of fire dissecting the oncoming marine attack. F Company was locked down, couldn't get out of there. Echo came, my company came to their aid. We got locked down, we couldn't get out of there. Golf was eventually brought up to try to make headway to, so we could disengage. What the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese would do would be to pull us in as close as they could, as if we're gonna pull someone in by the belt and get them right up close, start fire on them. This way, we couldn't bring in supporting fire, which was artillery and aircraft and maybe naval gunfire. Well, this battle went on all day, back and forth, back and forth. We finally were able to disengage somewhat. The North Vietnamese brought in their supporting artillery from the DMZ. We brought in our supporting artillery. We never were able to overrun them. They were never able to come out of their bunkers and get to us. Uh, they finally, at the end of the day, disengaged and disappeared. We pulled back. We went in, got our dead and wounded, and brought them back. Two things about this battle that bothers me very much, and it has been bothering me for a long time. The first thing was we left 15 Marines there. We were not able to go back to get them for two weeks. 
And the other thing was when we had to take the fallen Marines that we could pull back and put them on choppers. Those are memories that, don't, that never leave me. We went up there, they say, with maybe 600 uh, in the beginning of September, the, the, the battalion, and we came back at the end of October with less than half uh, that number that were fit to fight. I was injured four days before I got out of there. I was never wounded, and thank, I thank God for that. When we went back two weeks later to recover the bodies, we found them mutilated. Uh, in fact, they had tacked onto a tree a, a Marine Corps tattoo that one of the Marines had on his chest. And that's something we never did to the enemy. We were at Conti in that time, uh, just short of 60 days. We had been up there earlier in July uh, in support of another battalion. Uh, and then, it's, but those were 60 long days. The word war is a small word that encompasses a lot of things, but combat is more specific. And combat is hard to describe. It's dirty, it's vile, it's instills fear. And it's a horrible thing. I think anybody that goes through combat is changed forever. I, I think it, uh, it always stays with you in one way or the other. Yeah. And it was Agent Orange, uh, we saw it all over. We saw it down south where I was initially. We saw it up uh, near the forest in the, uh, near Camp Evans. Uh, it was all over. The, uh, you could see it on the leaves of the vegetation like a powder of some sort. Uh, it's left its mark on me. I've had cancer from, uh, related to uh, Agent Orange. And it's, it's actually, I don't think there's one person in Vietnam that it hasn't affected because it was all over and it doesn't dissolve. Once it's in the fat of your body, it's there, it's a dioxin. I did r and in December after being in country about 11 months because I had a couple of things happen and I couldn't get it probably sooner than that. I went to Taipei. The first three hours in Taipei, I spent in a shower getting red clay off my body. I, uh, I did a cultural tour of Taipei. I went to museums, believe it or not, and I went to waterfalls up in the mountains, and, and I did a little drinking. First, and mo most important thing was getting that plane off the tarmac in Da Nang. Tet was in full scale at the time. And, uh, that was the primary thing. But the other thing was to come home. I was being discharged shortly thereafter. See my, I had a son born while I was over there. Seeing my son, my wife, my family, and getting on with my life and essentially leaving that behind me. I think John McInerney was influential in helping me open up. He, he got me to go to a reunion after I said 25 years ago. And I met fellow Marines who shared similar experiences, same places, six months either side of each other. And we could talk about it. We could understand each other. And we, that's when I started to talk about it. I would hope we, from this war, we did learn something, uh, meaning the Vietnam War. Uh, one of the things I think we should have learned is if you're going to do it, do it completely, do it with a commitment to finish. But first of all, before you commit, before you do it, make sure it's the right thing to do. Maybe this wasn't the right thing to do. I still have questions in my mind about this, and I'm kind of a right of center individual, and I can still question it. I think the people that should remember that those they send to fight the battles for this country do so in an honest, meaningful way. They join the service as a sense of commitment to their country. They're not political. They go where they're told, they do what they're told, and they fight hard, and they give. And the given never doesn't stop after they get home.
So if you're going to do it, do it the right way and honor these veterans. Well, I think the experience overall on a positive side made me determined when I got home to do something positive for myself and, and keep going and, and, and seeing what can happen. Life is short and can be very short. And, and it really drove me, I think, in later years to achieve certain things in my life.